This video is brought to you by Skillshare. More on that later. In the beginning, there was only table tennis. Though this game may look like Pong, it's not actually Pong, it's table tennis. Played on the Magnavox Odyssey, which predated the more popular arcade Pong machine by just two months in 1972. And what's generally agreed as the first lawsuit in video game history was argued by nearly everyone in early video game history over who had the rights to make and sell this game, which itself was arguably a copycat clone of the very first video game concept ever, made way back in 1958, back when this game was called Tennis for Two, played on a National Research Lab's oscilloscope. Yeah, you know, they do kind of look and play different, and I said arguably because that was the argument Nintendo's lawyers made when they ended up getting involved in these lawsuits a decade later in 1982. But back in the 70s, the Magnavox Odyssey version got to the market first and predated Pong by weeks. But over the next six years, Pong patent lawsuits between all corners of the early industry eventually ended in settlements. This decade set the precedent that competitors are probably eventually going to decide to join each other rather than beat each other. Atari agreed to pay licensing fees to Magnavox, who eventually decided to just go do other things. Atari set its sights on transitioning over to a home console company later, but there was already the Fairchild Channel F machine on the market. And the reason why Fairchild's name faded out, but Atari 2600's ended up sticking, is because of another precedent set in the late 70s. Most software companies are probably not actually going to last very long, unless they get bought out by a bajillion dollar parent company. Instead of being owned by a toy company, Atari got bought out by one of the media oligarchs. In 1976, Warner Communications bought Atari for $28 million, which is pennies compared to what's going to happen later. That capital was supposed to be going towards the development of their own home console, the Atari 2600, but it evidently also went towards a string of lawsuits that had them fiercely defending their near-monopoly, their corner of an oligopoly of a much smaller landscape of arcade and home console gaming. For starters, there was a $15 million lawsuit against some MIT college students who were selling modification boards for Atari's arcade games. And secondly, there was another multi-million dollar lawsuit going against a brand new company called Activision, a company made by former Atari employees who were fed up with how they weren't getting credited for their work, nor for getting a fair share of the profits they were helping the company earn. Designed by Steve Cartwright for Activision. And once again, Atari decided that if you can't beat them, join them. The lawsuit settled. The Activision defendants were allowed to keep making and selling Atari games so long as they gave Atari a share of the cut, which began the model of third-party console developers as we know today. But these licensing deals, and even these buyouts, can be quite fickle alliances. Those MIT dropouts who were making mod boards? They were hired on to work for Atari as part of the settlement, but they ended up still selling to the Atari competition anyway. That's actually how Midway made Miss Pac-Man. In the words of one of the developers, quote, they saw this as a great way to keep the Pac-Man assembly line going. And 50 years of gaming history would repeat these patterns. When a small, young company is going through hard times, let's say they're on the defense for copying or modifying a bigger company's product, or they're suffering from some creative bankruptcy or burnout after a string of early successes, they're going to be looking for buyers to stave those wounds before they either die out early within the following decade, or keep on living long enough over multiple decades themselves to later on become some kind of villain in another company's story, if they get an injection of capital from a supersized outsider. But I gotta give a qualification here to which side of the fence I'm on. This is an industry full of insider secrecy, and there is a gulf of knowledge between consumers and producers. This is a topic with an especially large disparity in terms of how these acquisitions look to people inside the industry versus outside. A whole lifetime ago, in 2014, Game Developer Magazine said, quote, For many developers, selling their studio is the final prize for a race well run. An outcome like that is desired. It is the stated goal for why a lot of tech companies are founded in the first place. For the people inside who started in a company in their early days, a big buyout is not just a short-term windfall to cure short-term problems, but also a way to make retirement options suddenly look much, much better and finally put a capstone at the end of a career they're proud of. Even if they don't like their new owners, they don't gotta put up with them long. If you're a founder making a fortune selling a tech company, you're probably gonna be living a comfortable lifestyle for yourself and your children for the rest of your days. 
But those outcomes are not of concern for fans outside the studio, who will continue hungering for more of what won the studio their fandom in the early days. And both companies will still have financial incentives to never be honest about these factors. It's in everyone's interest on both sides to keep selling products at an equal or greater rate, to keep that Pac-Man assembly line going. But going back to the 80s, despite how infamously excessive they were, that decade didn't see a lot of video game giants buying and merging with each other after the first ones in line got it out of their system with the Pong lawsuits in the 70s. Remember that back then, video games were still seen as a short-term fad of children's toys. Games weren't 10 years old yet, the console market crashed in 82, the long-term value of cutthroat multi-million dollar corporate politics didn't seem worth it until the 90s. When negativity started to arise over the question of what happens to a studio after getting bought out by Electronic Arts. In 1982, when EA was first created, its intentions were a lot of the same causes that Activision was also originally fighting for. To give developers more credit, more creative freedom, and more of a profit share than they would have been getting out of bigger companies. EA's original model was arguably founded entirely on the idea of selling other studios' projects. They were envisioning a model similar to a record label's relationship with music artists because I guess they never read up on just how unfair, exploitative, and hated a model that actually was. With few in-house developers of their own, EA's early projects have mostly always been made by external developers, and their pattern of buying studios out entirely didn't really start until the early 90s, when you can begin scrolling down this long list of studios acquired by EA that don't exist anymore. Origin Systems, the creators of Ultima, Wing Commander, System Shock, and Privateer, saw review scores decline and leadership leave and franchises gradually fizzle away over the six years following acquisition, when they stopped making anything other than Ultima and then closed altogether. Bullfrog Productions shares a similar story, making a lot of highly reviewed, creative, ambitious hits in the early 90s before being acquired in 95. Two years later, the founder leaves and a lot of employees follow him. Six years later, the company gets folded away into another EA division and ceases to exist. Maxis was bought by them in 1997 for $125 million, which looked really weird from the outside at the time. When SimCity was such a massive mainstream cultural phenomenon, you wouldn't have thought they'd needed it. But internal interviews have since revealed that around the turn of the millennium, The Sims was a project so expensive it was bleeding Maxis dry, and while the EA acquisition did help launch The Sims as yet another massively successful mainstream phenomenon, that soon became the only thing Maxis would make, until years turned into decades as you saw their quality decline, the founder leave, other developers gradually follow, until the offices finally closed down in 2015. The brand is still around, but in name only. Westwood Studios was purchased by EA in 1998 for $122 million, and they folded way faster. They previously made a strong lineup of Command & Conquers alongside some other IPs under ownership of Virgin Interactive, but EA's ownership demanded less creativity and more hits, which they could not provide under deadlines. They were bought by EA in 1997 and closed by EA in 2003. It felt like EA had its hands everywhere back then. They were even partnering with Square back around the turn of the millennium, where they briefly struck a deal to distribute some of Squaresoft's Japanese games in the West, while Square would distribute some Western games in Japan. Squint and you'll miss it, but in some of their early PS2 games, you'll see the company calling itself Square Electronic Arts. Square kept the EA branding off most of their games, but that was the behind-the-scenes corporate reality until 2003, when the biggest merger in game publishing at the time happened between Square and Enix, pushing EA's fingers out in the process. This was a merger so dramatic and so well documented with so many different perspectives and materials to cover it could easily be a whole 30 minute topic of its own, but it's important because it's the first on this list where you see one of these deals get struck between two giant publishers within the industry rather than between a giant publisher and a smaller studio. The, the short version is that Enix was a mega popular publisher of Dragon Quest in Japan, but they had little overseas penetration where Squaresoft was releasing hits year after year on both sides of the pond in the late 90s and the new millennium. For years, they'd been talking to strike up some kind of partnership to combine those strengths until Squaresoft reported a big loss after the flop of their foray into computer-generated movie making with Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. Enix got spooked by how much money Square lost on that project, and they wanted to pull out, but a new company president talked them back in. 
The Square Board of Directors decided on someone with a completely different vision for the company. Former President Hisashi Suzuki's idea of investing into computer animated movies was swapped out for Yoichi Wada's idea of trying to turn Square Enix into an electronic arts of its own, a giant game publisher capable of shipping annual blockbusters on both hemispheres of the planet. But that didn't exactly pan out. His leadership after the merger saw the cancellation of projects and Square's internal studios becoming a Final Fantasy factory that would make spin-off sequels of spin-off sequels to cut down development costs. Enix's old Dragon Quest IP ironically started picking up the slack that Square's own brands were leaving behind, as was also their reliance on Western acquisitions like Eidos Interactive, who were bought out with the promises of creative freedom and loose leashes, but eventually held to unrealistic sales goals, considered a failure, and then folded and renamed into Square Enix Europe. This decade after the merger was, according to the president who got ousted at least, a total failure. Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu left in anger, claiming that Yoichi Wada decided to relocate their headquarters based off a fortune teller's advice. Wada was not exactly a popular president inside the company. In 2012, the board decided to replace Wada with the current president, Yosuke Matsuda, who's rebooted projects and diversified their IPs for what has been a somewhat more comfortable second decade so far for the company, until we see what his supposed NFT games are supposed to turn out to be. That is. But their decision to invest so much in an FF7 remake was one I have been told they were saving for a strategic moment when they would really need it, and they were still feeling the pressure to split that one up into three spin-off sequels of its own. All of these changes in leadership, and the anger expressed by former leadership, and the perceived decline in quality over that first decade are problems that still would have seemed mostly invisible to the average gamers on the outside world this whole time. Square Enix's brands never faded from the headlines, nor the top 10 selling lists, and Nobuo Uematsu kept getting hired to keep making Final Fantasy music anyway, just independently this time instead of in-house, and you know, for someone playing the game, what difference does that really make? It really highlights more how much dissonance there is between the consumer and the producer experiences of trying to figure out how video games are made. And for this period, the early to mid-2000s, is when that gulf widened to a degree where these deals become impossible to visualize unless you already have the expertise of knowing how to picture the distribution of hundreds of millions of dollars. In 2002, Microsoft bought Rareware for $375 million. Coming off a perceived slump where its later Nintendo games were being critically applauded but underselling off of store shelves. But despite how much it would have looked to your average outside gamer, Rare was not actually entirely owned by Nintendo. They were just a close second party partner. So when Microsoft was eyeing first party developers for the fresh new original Xbox, they got their giant coffers of Windows money to put them at the top of Rare's bidding list, above Activision and Nintendo who were both fighting over them for a while. But Nintendo didn't want to outbid Microsoft, and their lack of confidence in the studio's early 2000s releases may have been smarter than us outsiders will ever know. N not to mention at least the 30 employees who left shortly after the buyout, but something definitely must have happened for them to lose a lot of their 90s magic for the releases following the acquisition, which didn't review well nor sell well as the company gradually became an Xbox Connect avatar factory. Up until 2018 when Sea of Thieves happened, which has been a huge success story in its own right, but did not happen until a whopping 16 years after their purchase by Microsoft. Would Sea of Thieves not have happened if the buyout hadn't happened? Over a time period that big with so many changes happening over such a long time, history really could have gone all sorts of ways. And Nintendo's doing better than they were in 2002. I don't think they're regretting it. In 2005, we also had the second big purchase between publishers, and again, it's between Japanese heavyweights, just two who were aging past their golden years from the 80s. In 2002, the president of Namco retired, opening up the chance for a lucrative $1.7 billion deal to merge with Bandai, breaking the financial records of even Square Enix's price, despite there being way less drama around Bamco than there was with Squeenix. There's uh, not as much bad blood to read through with this one. We didn't hear much about it, except for when it comes to Monolith Soft, the developers of the Xenosaga series, who had felt they were being given less creative freedom from the new change in leadership. Monolith splintered off to get bought out by Nintendo instead, where they would go on to make Xenoblade Chronicles three years after the deal, which became a big hit with a lot of sequels, while they were also doing work on Smash Brothers and Zelda in the years afterwards as well. 
2005 and onwards is such a transformative period for how much bigger, how much more expensive, and how much more risky it would become to gamble on the competition of the video game industry. And one move that absolutely upset the balance of power, and probably the closest we've come so far to seeing a monopoly in action since the 70s, was when EA purchased an exclusive licensing deal for NFL football for a figure reported around $1 billion. Before this deal, we saw a three-way competition between Midway's NFL Blitz, Sega's NFL 2K series, and EA's Madden NFL. But after this deal, American football games are mostly just Madden. If you want to play the rest of the world's football, you got options. If you want to play hyper-violent, ridiculous, fantasy land, mutant monster football, you got options. But if you want to play a more down-to-earth, normal vision of regular, ordinary American football, you're basically stuck with Madden. And it... It boggles my mind just how much of the industry's lifeblood runs on Madden, even though their little mini-monopoly has created total apathy for the brand. I mean, no one gives a damn about Madden. Nobody talks about Madden. After so many years of the quality of Madden getting worse and worse and worse, no one cares about Madden anymore. But it still sells tens of millions every year and will keep selling tens of millions, and that is probably a perfectly legal situation that's never gonna stop, and a best case scenario dream situation that a big video game corporation would want anyway. <sighs> so, in 2006, EA acquires Mythic Entertainment. In 2007, Vivendi acquires Activision, which means that in 2008, Activision merged with Blizzard for $18.9 billion. And at that time, World of Warcraft was one of those mainstream phenomenon successes that looked to the outside world like a bastion of financial security, but Blizzard's owners at the time, Vivendi, they were actually going through hard times and looking to sell. Vivendi's deal with Activision saw their own Vivendi branding fizzle away into the Aether, while Activision got to combine its brand with the power house name of Blizzard, who is keeping the good times rolling with the incoming releases of StarCraft 2, Diablo 3, Hearthstone, Overwatch, and then, I don't know, things suddenly got a lot more quiet and slow since 2015-ish. Oh no, sexual harassment was happening. Suddenly productivity halted to a stop and Blizzard's upcoming sequels keep getting stuck in development hell. For six years, they've been doing remakes instead. And during that window, Activision actually bought itself back from Vivendi for $8 billion, even though Activision was still just called Activision Blizzard that whole time until 2016, when it spent $6 billion becoming Activision Blizzard King. From the 2010s onwards, this stuff goes by way too fast to list them all, and the numbers keep getting bigger and bigger as major game publishers consolidate into increasingly larger giants that spend more money than ever on less games than ever that still earn more money than ever, while at the same time smaller publishers who are calling themselves indie publishers keep popping up to fill up the lower rungs of the bracket. Like how, in 2009, Activision bought Red Octane and ground it to a stop by overproducing yearly Guitar Hero sequels. Red Octane's not around anymore because they got turned into a Guitar Hero factory to compete with Viacom buying Harmonix to become a rock band factory, but they wisened up and bought themselves back out to become independent again around the time promisingly independent games like Minecraft wound up getting bought by Microsoft for $2.5 billion. The same year crowdfunding got big and the independent Kickstarter funded Oculus would get bought out by Facebook for another $2 billion. The Minecraft to Microsoft deal is one of the odd ones on this list I actually think worked out for the better, but the Oculus to Facebook one? Absolutely, positively not. Meanwhile, Harmonix didn't actually want to stay independent for long. It turns out a lot of companies don't want to anyway. They sold to Epic Games. From the mid-2010s onwards, those numbers reach into the billions, and they just keep going up. It never stops, as bigger and more distant parent companies become the only ones able to afford the increasingly astronomical costs of making one AAA video game. In 2012, Chinese tech holding conglomerate Tencent got a foothold on the path to eventually throwing around the largest amount of money the video game industry will see in pure dollars, with their 40% stake in Epic Games, and then their purchase of Riot Games in 2014. Their most expensive billion dollar purchases are for mobile game companies this channel's audience might not even be aware of. Supercell in 2016, Leiyu in 2020, and Sumo Group in 2021. But the era of big publishers buying up other big publishers is returning on cue, and 
possibly even consolidating to a close, now that we're seeing the popularization of Microsoft Xbox Game Pass, which really got super big in 2018. We know what's going on now. Big publishers are going to want to spend big money to buy up exclusive rights to launch big games on their own subscription-based publisher-branded services in the future, which helps explain EA scooping up Codemasters, Playdemic, and Glue all in 2021. The year that saw a behemoth of a deal, the biggest since Activision Blizzard, when Microsoft bought Bethesda, publisher to publisher, for $8 billion. But for 2022, this year's $68 billion deal of Activision to Microsoft is something that absolutely dwarfs everything else on this list. There's no comparison. After Activision has already bought up so much of the rest of the industry by itself, there's not even a lot of other publishers that large even left on the list. Uh, Take two, maybe? A deal between publishers of that magnitude may not be able to even happen again for about a decade. But that's how long it takes to really fairly gauge the effects of a big money buyout or merger. Four years, and then maybe up to a decade. In those first couple years, the employees may get relocated to a fancier office, they may get massive retention bonuses, and a big influx of capital to increase the polish and scope and features of the first shiny new games to come out of the deal that they're going to want to specialize on over other backup projects and contract work that they no longer have to rely on as much. And the lesson, for those of us who were fans of these companies, is that these companies are more disposable than fans are ever going to want to believe. More disposable than the marketing has invested gajillions of dollars into getting fans to believe in. The individual humans who start these companies are not going to want to run them forever. The behind-the-scenes human reality is that the prospect of retiring rich is going to outweigh a lot of other choices to continue working after selling their companies. And once founders leave, other employees follow. Once offices relocate and upgrade, once the necessity that mother's invention fades away, a company's culture inevitably changes. Every single time. And the time it takes after acquisition to see those changes really come into effect times up with how long it takes to make a big game anyway. Two years, three years, maybe four to five years if it's prestige gaming we're talking about. But the basic neoliberal economic rules of the game we're all playing dictates that decreased competition will increase prices and lower product quality for the consumer. And the precedent set by early video game history, by how fiercely Activision defended their near monopoly of console gaming, and how fiercely EA defends their near monopoly of NFL football games, and how fiercely Microsoft itself defended its own actual real monopolies, is that whoever's at the top of an industry will absolutely predictably defend their position fiercely, illegally if necessary, if the costs of losing a lawsuit are smaller than the cost of throwing the competition a bone. There's a lot of goodwill facing Microsoft off now, but the closer they get to a monopoly or an oligopoly, the higher the price for their Xbox Game Pass is gonna get. The reason it's so cheap right now is just to hook you in for when they raise prices later. Over the years, goodwill reverses and zigzags back and forth. Over the decades, underdogs become villains and villains become redeemed. The cycles of capitalism repeat ad infinitum until bubbles burst and markets crash as what happened with Atari's console gaming in the early 80s. We're still a good four to five years, maybe to a decade out, of gauging what the competition against Xbox Game Pass is really supposed to look like. Sony's working on something, Ubisoft and EA already got something, but whatever ends up happening, remember that a few worst case scenario situations have already happened, with regards to 80s Atari and mid-2000s EA. The moment anyone works in businesses this big, they're facing powerful, impossible incentives to keep prices as high as possible and keep the competition as unbalanced as possible. And to help navigate the job market of this increasingly competitive world, consider looking up Going Freelance, Building and Branding Your Own Success from Skillshare where you'll learn how to build a resume, a portfolio, and a network of contacts to help navigate and market your way to corporate pitches. Skillshare has sponsored this video with a free one-month trial for the first 1,000 subscribers who click the link in the description, so you can start exploring your creativity today. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers thousands of inspiring classes for stuff this channel might have gotten you interested in. Writing quality stories for both fiction and nonfiction, character development and illustration, game design and social media marketing, all curated specifically for learning, so there's no ads and a constant stream of new premium classes. 
They're created and hosted by award-winning experts, and they have a library of thousands of classes covering everything from creative skills to financial literacy to how to start up your own businesses. So once again, that's one free month for clicking the link in the description. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring, and thanks again for watching. of Americans were self-employed. Now it's about 2%. So? It's called consolidation. Strengthen governments and corporations, weaken individuals.